Good morning, I'm Joey Haber from the Flying Tortoise Academy in Portland, Oregon, and welcome to another daily Gong Fu workout. Today we're going to go over line four of a Leong Bhagwat Song old eight set. Um, there's a lot of work for Peach Wan, and I hope you enjoy. Finish. You will work for six months unpaid on a fool's errand. Yeah. And at the end of six months, we will drive him away. We might even beat him for his presumption. And then we can use whatever he has done so far as the foundations of the wall that we will complete in the years to come. There is no risk to us of losing Freya, let alone the sun or moon. Why would he say yes to building it in a season? Asked Tyr, god of war. He may not say yes, said Loki, but he seems arrogant and sure of himself and not the kind to refuse a challenge. All the gods grunted and clapped Loki on the back and told him that he was a very crafty fellow and it was a good thing that he was crafty on their side and now they would get their foundations built for nothing and they congratulated each other on their intelligence and their bargaining ability. Freya said nothing. She fingered her necklace of light, the gift of the precincts. This was the same necklace that had been stolen from her by Loki form of a seal when she was bathing, and that Heimdall had fought in seal form with Loki to return to her. She did not trust Loki. She did not care for the way this conversation had gone. The gods called the builder into their hall. He looked around at the gods. They all seemed in good humor, grinning and nudging each other and smiling. Freya, however, did not smile. Well, asked the builder, you asked for three seasons, said Loki. We will give you one season and one season only. Tomorrow is the first day of winter. If you are not finished on the first day of summer, you leave here unpaid. But if you have finished building the wall as high and as thick and as impregnable as we have agreed, then you will be given everything you have asked for, the moon, the sun, and the beautiful Freya. You may have no help in building your wall from anyone. You must build this wall alone. The stranger said nothing for some moments. He stared away into the distance and seemed to be weighing Loki's words and conditions. Then he looked at the gods and he shrugged. You have said I may have no outside help. I would like my horse, Swathulfari to help me haul the stones here, the stones I will use to build the wall, I do not believe this to be an unreasonable request. It is not unreasonable, agreed Odin. And the other gods nodded and told each other that horses were good for hauling heavy stones. They swore oaths then, the mightiest of oaths, the gods and the stranger, that neither side could betray the other. They swore on their weapons, and they swore on Drogneir, Odin's golden armory, and they swore on Gungnir, Odin's spear, and an oath sworn on Gungnir was unbreakable. The next morning, as the sun rose, the gods stood to watch the man work. He spat on his hands, and he began to dig the trench into which the first stones would go. He digs deep, said Hengdahl. He digs fast, said Frey. Freya's brother. Well, yes, obviously he is a mighty digger of ditches and trenches, said Loki grudgingly, but imagine how many stones you will have to haul here from the mountains. It is one thing to dig a trench, it is another to haul stones many miles unaided and then to place them, one stone upon the next, so tightly fitted that not an ant could crawl between them, higher than the tallest giant, to make a wall. Freya looked Loki with disgust, but she said nothing. When the sun set, the builder mounted his horse and set off for the mountains to gather his first rocks. The horse dragged an empty stone boat behind it, a low sled that it pulled across the soft earth. The gods watched them leave. The moon was high and pale in the early winter sky. He will be back in a week, said Loki. I am curious to see how many rocks that horse can haul. It looks strong. The gods went to their feast hall then, and there was much merriment and laughter, but Freya did not laugh. It snowed before dawn, a light dusting of snow 
snowflakes, a presentiment of the deep snows that would come further into the winter. Heimdall, who saw everything approaching Asgard and who missed nothing, woke the gods in the darkness. They gathered by the trench the stranger had dug the previous day. In the gathering dawn, they watched the builder walking beside his horse, coming toward them. The horse was steadily dragging a score of blocks of granite, so heavy that the sled made deep ruts in the black earth. When the man saw the gods, he waved and called good morning cheerfully. He pointed to the rising sun and he winked at the gods. Then he unhitched his horse from the rocks and let it graze while he began to manhandle the first of the granite blocks into the trench he had already dug to receive it. Right. The horse Extra rotation. is indeed strong, said Balder, most beautiful of all the Aesir. No normal horse should be able to drag rocks that heavy. It is stronger than we imagined, said Kvasir, the wise. Ah, said Loki, the horse will soon tire. This was its first day on the job. It will not be able to haul that many stones every night. And winter is coming. The snows will be deep and thick. The blizzards will be blinding and the way to the mountain will be difficult. There is nothing to worry about. This is all going according to plan. I hate you so much, said Freya, who stood unsmiling beside Loki. She walked back to Asgard in the dawn and did not stay to watch the stranger build the foundation of the wall. Each night, the builder and the horse and the empty stone boat left for the mountain. Each morning they returned, with the horse dragging another twenty blocks of granite, every block larger than the tallest man. Each day the wall grew. And by evening, it was bigger and more imposing than it had been before. Odin called the gods to him. The wall is growing apace, he said. And we swore an unbreakable oath, a ring oath and a weapon oath, that if he finishes building his wall in time, we will give him the sun and the moon and the hand in marriage of Freya the Beautiful. Varsa the Wise said, no man can do what this master builder is doing. I suspect that he must be something other than a man. A giant, said Odin. Figure Perhaps. If only Thor were here, sighed Baldur. Thor is hammering trolls away in the east, said Odin. And even if he were to return, our oaths are mighty and binding. Loki tried to reassure them. We are like old women, getting ourselves all worried about nothing. The builder cannot finish the wall before the first day of summer, even if he is the most powerful giant in the land. It is impossible. I wish Thor were here, said Hengville. He would know what to do. The snows fell, but the deep snow did not stop the wall builder, and it did not slow Swatlovari, his horse. The grey stallion pulled his sled, piled high with rocks, through snowdrifts and through blizzards, up steep hills and down again through icy gorges. The days began to get longer. Internal rotation. Dawn came earlier each morning. The snows began to melt, and the wet mud that was exposed was thick and heavy, the kind of mud that clings to your boots and drags you down. The horse will never be able to haul those rocks through the mud, said Loki. They will sink, and he will lose his footing. But Swathalfari was sure-footed and implacable, even in the thickest, wettest mud, and he hauled the rocks to Asgard, although the stone boat was so heavy it cut deep gashes into the sides of the hills. Now the builder was hauling the rocks up hundreds of feet, and man handling each rock into place. The mud dried, and the spring flowers came out. Yellow colt's foot, and white wood anemones in profusion. And the wall being built around Asgard was a glorious, imposing thing. When it was finished, it would be impregnable. No 
giant, no troll, no dwarf, no mortal would be able to breach that wall. And the stranger continued to build it with relentless good humor. He did not seem to care if it rained or it snowed, and neither did his horse. Each morning they would bring the rocks from the mountains. Each day the builder would lay the granite blocks upon the previous layer. Now it was the last day of winter, and the wall was all but completed. The gods sat on their thrones in Asgard, and they spoke. The sun, said Balder, we have given away the sun. We placed the moon in the sky in order to mark off the days and the weeks of the year, said Bragi, god of poetry, moodily. Figure eight. Now there will be no moon. And Freya, what will we do without Freya? Asked Tyr. If this builder is actually a giant, said Freya, with ice in her voice, then I will marry him and follow him back to Jotunheim. And it will be interesting to see whom I hate more. Him for taking me away, or all of you for giving me to him. Now, don't be like that, began Loki, but Freya interrupted him and said, If this giant does take me, and the sun, and the moon, then I ask only one thing from the gods of Asgard. Name it, said Odin Allfather, who had said nothing until now. I would like to see whoever caused this calamity killed before I go, said Freya. I think it only fair if I am to go into the land of the frost giants, if the moon and the sun are to be plucked from the sky and the world plunged into eternal darkness, then the life of the one who got us to this point should be forfeit. Ah, said Loki, the apportioning of blame is so yeah, mine for was exactly who suggested what. As I recall, all the gods shared equally in this unfortunate mistake. We all suggested it. We all agreed to it. You suggested it, said Freya. You talked these idiots into it, and I will see you dead before I leave Asgard. We all began Loki, but he saw the expressions on the faces of all the gods in that hall, and he fell silent. Loki, son of Loive, said Odin, this is the result of your poor counsel, and it was as bad as all your other advice, said Balder. Loki shot him a resentful glance. We need the builder to lose his wager, said Odin, without violating the oath, he must fail. I don't know what you expect me to do about it, said Loki. I do not expect anything from you, said Odin. But if this builder succeeds in finishing his wall by the end of tomorrow, then your death will be painful and long, and a bad and shameful death at that. Loki looked from one god to the next, and in each of their faces he saw his death, saw anger and resentment. He did not see mercy or forgiveness. It would be a bad death indeed. The alternatives. What could he do? He did not dare to attack the builder. On the other hand, Loki nodded. Leave it to me. He walked from the hall, and none of the gods tried to stop him. The builder finished placing his load of stones on the wall. Tomorrow, on the first day of summer, as the sun was setting, he would finish his walk. And then he would leave Asgard with his wages. Only twenty more granite blocks to go. He clambered down the rough wooden scaffolding and whistled for his horse. Swarthalfari was grazing, as he normally was, in the long grass at the edge of the forest, almost half a mile from the wall. But he always came with his master whistle. The builder grabbed the ropes that attached to the empty stone boat okay, first part. and prepared to hitch it to his great grey horse. The sun was low in the sky, okay. but it would not set for several hours. I and the fall. disk of the moon was pale, but it was there, high in the heavens as well. Soon both of them would be his, the greater light and the lesser. And Freya, the lady, who was more beautiful than either the 
the sun or the moon, that the builder would not count his winnings before they were in his hands. He had worked so hard and so long for all the winter. He whistled for the horse again. Colin. He had never needed to whistle twice. He could see Swathopari now, shaking his head and almost prancing in the wildflowers of the spring meadow. The horse would take a step forward and then a step back, as if he could scent something enticing in the warm air of the spring evening, but could not tell what the scent was. Swathopari! called the builder, and the stallion pricked his ears up and moved into a swift canter across the meadow, heading for the builder. The builder watched his horse head toward him, and he felt satisfied. The hoofbeats pounded across the meadow, doubling and redoubling, with the echoes that bounced from the high, grey granite wall. So for one moment, the builder imagined that a whole herd of horses was coming toward him. No, thought the builder, just one horse. He shook his head and realized his mistake. Not one horse. Not one set of hoofbeats. Two. The other horse was a chestnut mare. The builder knew she was a mare immediately. He didn't have to look between her legs. Every line of her, every inch of her, everything about the chestnut was female. Swathalfari wheeled as he ran across the meadow. Then he slowed and reared and neighed loudly. The chestnut mare ignored him. She stopped running as if he were not there, and she put her head down and seemed to be cropping the grass as Swathalfari approached her. But when he was within a dozen yards, she began to run from him, a canter that became a gallop. And the grey stallion ran behind her, trying to catch her, always a length or two behind, nipping at her rump and tail with his teeth, yet always missing. They ran across the meadow together in the creamy golden light of the end of the day, the grey horse and the brown sweat glistening on their flanks. It was almost a dance. The builder clapped his hands loudly and whistled and called Swathofari's name. But the stallion ignored him. The builder ran out, intending to catch the horse and bring him back to his senses. But the chestnut mare seemed almost to know what he intended, for she slowed and rubbed her ears and mane against the side of the stallion's head and then ran as if wolves were after her toward the edge of the forest. Swathofari ran after her, and in moments they both vanished into the shadows of the wood. The builder cursed and spat and waited for his horse to reappear. The shadows lengthened, and Swathofari did not return. The builder returned to his stone boat. He looked into the woods, and he spat on his hands, took hold of the ropes, and began to haul the stone boat across the meadow of grasses and spring flowers toward the mountain quarry. He did not return at dawn. The sun was already high in the sky by the time the builder returned to Asgard, hauling the stone boat behind him. He had ten stone blocks on the stone boat, all he could manage, and he was hauling and heaving the stone boat and cursing the stones, but with each heat got closer to the wall. Beautiful Freya stood at the gateway, watching him. You have only ten stone blocks with you, she told him. You will need twice that many bricks to finish our wall. Okay, peach wine. The builder said nothing. He carried on hauling his blocks toward the unfinished gateway, his face a mask. There were no smiles, no winks, not any longer. Thor is returning from the east, Freya told him. He will be with us soon. The gods of Asgard came out to watch the builder as he hauled the rocks toward the wall. They joined Freya, stood about her protectively. They watched, silently at first, and then they began to smile and to chuckle and to call out questions. Hey, shouted Baldur, you only get the sun if you finish that wall. Do you think you will be taking the sun home with you? And the moon, said Breaky. Such a pity you do not have your horse with you. He could have carried all the rocks you need. And the gods laughed. The builder let go of the stone boat then. He faced the gods. You cheated, he said. Yeah, yeah. And his 
Queen Sigyn, who had been happy and beautiful when Loki courted and married her, but now always looked like she was expecting bad news. She bore him a son, Narfi, and shortly afterward another son, Barley. Sometimes Loki would vanish for long periods and not return, and then Sigyn would look like she was expecting the very worst news of all. But always Loki would come back to her, looking shifty and guilty, and also as if he were very proud of himself indeed. Three times he went away. Three times he eventually returned. The third time Loki returned to Asgard, Odin called Loki to him. I have dreamed a dream, said the wise old one-eyed god. You have children. I have a son, Narvi, a good boy, although I must confess that he does not always listen to his father. And another son, Bali, obedient and restrained. Not them. You have three other children, Loki. You have been sneaking off to spend your days and your nights in the land of the Frost Giants with Angabotha, the giantess. When she has borne you three children, I have seen them in the eye of my mind as I sleep, and my visions tell me that they will be the greatest foes of the gods in the time that is to come. Loki said nothing. He tried to look ashamed, and succeeded simply in looking pleased for himself. Odin called the gods to him, with Tyr and Thor at their head, and he told them that they would be journeying far into Jotunheim, to giant land, to bring Loki's children to Asgard. The gods traveled into the land of the giants, battling many dangers until they reached Amgabotha's keep. She was not expecting, and she had left her children playing together in her great hall. The gods were shocked when they saw what Loki and Angabotha's children were, but that did not deter them. They seized the children, and they bound them, and they carried the oldest between them, tied to the stripped trunk of a pine tree, and they muzzled the second child with a muzzle made from knotted willow, and they put a rope around its neck as a leash, while the third child walked beside them, grooming and disturbing. Those on the right of the third child saw a beautiful young girl, while those on the left tried not to look at her, for they saw a dead girl, her skin and flesh rotted black, walking in their midst. Have you noticed something? Thor asked Tyr, on the third day of their journey back through the land of the Frost Giants. They had camped for the night in a small clearing, and Tyr was scratching the furry neck of Loki's second child with his huge right hand. What? They are not following us, the giants. Not even the creature's mother has come after us. It's as if they want us to take Loki's children out of Jotunheim. That is foolish talk, said Tyr. But as he said it, even though the fire was warm, he shivered. Two more days of hard traveling, and they were in Odin's hall. These are the children of Loki, said Tyr shortly. The first of Loki's children was tied to a pine tree, and it was now longer than the pine tree it was tied to. It was called Jormungandr, and it was a serpent. It has grown many feet in the days we have carried it back, said Tyr. Thor said, Careful, it can spit burning black venom. It spat its poison at me, but it missed. That's why we tied its head to the tree like that. It is a child, said Odin. It is still growing. We will send it where it can harm nobody. Odin took the serpent to the shore of the sea that lies beyond all lands, the sea that circles Midgard, and there on the shore he freed Jormungandr and watched it slither and slip beneath the waves and swim away from some curls. Odin watched it with his one eye until it was lost on the horizon, and he wondered if he had done the right thing. He did not know. He had done as his dreams had told him, but dreams know more than they reveal, even to the wisest of the gods. The serpent 
and shackled his paws. He waited motionless while they did this. The gods smiled at each other as they chained the enormous wolf. Now, shouted Thor. Fenrir strained and stretched the muscles of his legs, and the chains snapped like dry twigs. The great wolf howled to the moon, a howl of triumph and joy. I broke your chains, he said. Do not forget this. We will not forget, said the gods. The next day, Tyr went to take the wolf his meat. I broke the fetters, said Fenrir. I broke them easily. You did, said Tyr. Do you think they will test me again? I grow, and I grow stronger with every day. They will test you again. I would wager my right hand on it, said Tyr. The wolf was still growing. And the gods were in the smithies, forging a new set of chains. Right, so Each link in the chains was too heavy for a normal man to lift. The metal of the chains was the strongest metal that the gods could find. Iron from the earth mixed with iron that had fallen from the sky. They called these chains Thoromi. The gods hauled the chains to where Fenrir slept. The wolf opened his eyes. Again, he said. If you can escape from these chains, said the gods, then your renown and your strength will be known to all the world. Glory will be yours. If chains like this cannot hold you, then your strength will be greater than that of any of the gods or the giants. Fenrir nodded at this and looked at the chains called Dromi, bigger than any chains had ever been, stronger than the strongest of bonds. There is no glory without danger, said the wolf after some moments. I believe I can break these bindings. Chain me up. They chained him. The great wolf stretched and strained, but the chains held. The gods looked at each other, and there was the beginning of triumph in their eyes, but now the huge wolf began to twist and to writhe, to kick out his legs and strain in every muscle and every sinew. His eyes flashed and his teeth flashed, and his jaws foamed. He growled as he writhed. He struggled with all his might. The gods moved back involuntarily, and it was good that they did so, for the chains fractured and then broke with such violence that the pieces were thrown far into the air, and for years to come the gods would find lumps of shattered shackles embedded in the sides of huge trees on the side of a mountain. Yes! shouted Fenrir, and howled in his victory like a wolf and like a man. The gods who had watched the struggle did not seem, the wolf observed, to delight in his victory. Not even Tyr. Fenrir, Loki's child, brooded on this and on other matters. And Fenris wolf grew huger and hungrier with each day that passed. Odin brooded and he pondered and he thought. All the wisdom of Mimir's well was his. And the wisdom he had gained from hanging from the world tree, a sacrifice to himself. At last he called the light elf Skirnir, Frey's messenger, to his side. And he described the chain called Kleipnir. Skirnir rode his horse across the rainbow bridge to Svartalfheim, with instructions to the dwarfs for how to create a chain unlike anything ever made before. The dwarfs listened to Skirnir described the commission, and they shivered, and they named their price. Skirnir agreed, as he had been instructed to do by Odin, although the dwarf's price was high. The dwarfs gathered the ingredients they would need to make Glaipnir. These were the six things dwarfs gathered. For firstly, the footsteps of a cat. For secondly, the beard of a woman. For thirdly, the roots of a mountain. For fourthly, the sinews of a bear. For fifthly, the breath of a fish. For sixth, and lastly, the spittle of a bird. Each of these things was used to make a clay 
Okay, it's time for today. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, please be sure to like and subscribe, and if you have any requests or questions, let me know. Take care.